Hi, hello, and welcome everyone to On the Safe Side, a podcast hosted by the editors of Safety and Health Magazine, the official magazine of the National Safety Council. My name is Barry Botino, and I'm an associate editor with Safety and Health. And with me, as always, are my fellow associate editors, Alan Ferguson and Kevin Drewley. Once again, we're coming to you from our respective homes as the National Safety Council employees are continuing to work remotely. And wherever you're listening today, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We also hope everyone out there is continuing to stay safe and healthy during this time. And as always, we want to thank all the safety professionals who are doing all they can do to keep our workers healthy and safe. A sincere thank you from all of us to all of you for all the extra efforts you've put in during the COVID-19 pandemic. If you'd like to keep up with the latest news on the pandemic and other daily updates from around the safety world, please check out our website. You can find us at safetyandhealthmagazine.com. This is episode number nine of On the Safe Side, and this month we'll do a deep dive into one of our stories from the November issue of Safety and Health with Kevin, who will discuss the importance of contact tracing at workplaces. We'll also talk to a couple of our NSC colleagues and safety consulting experts as part of our Five Questions With segment, and this month we'll cover powered industrial trucks. So please take a listen to that, and of course, stay tuned for our always enjoyable pop quiz. Uh, We'll talk about our bests and worsts when it comes to the food on our tables during the holiday season. Now let's dig into this month's episode, will we? Each month here at On the Safe Side, we take a closer look at the story from the pages of Safety and Health Magazine, which we call our deep dive segment. This month, Kevin has a story that's very relevant and timely about contact tracing, a key step in attempting to control the COVID-19 pandemic. In that story, Kevin explores how technology can aid in contact tracing and how employers can address concerns about privacy. So, Kevin, please take us on this latest deep dive, will you? Certainly, and thank you, Alan Ferguson, for that kind introduction. Uh, In a way, this is a deep dive about deep dives, or at least moderately deep ones. Uh, The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention recommends contact tracing for anyone who's come within six feet of an individual with COVID-19 for 15 minutes or more within 48 hours of diagnosis. And that might not sound like the most probing background check, but it's plenty thorough for disease control purposes from what we hear from experts. Um, Contact tracing as you'll hear or see in the story, and I know it's been elsewhere, it, it's really been part of the public health fabric for decades, but for many employers and many of us out there, it really just seems like a new concept as a pandemic evolved because we're hearing for it, we're hearing about it really for the first time within this occupational sphere. So the ones who have jurisdiction and the, the authority and responsibility for implementing contact tracing, that would be your state, tribal, local, and territorial health departments. And as you're reading the story or if you're, you're learning as you go, contact tracing, just to give that framework, it's used to support and monitor individuals who potentially were exposed to an infected person, in this case, um, someone infected with COVID-19. So in a hypothetical case of an individual testing positive for COVID-19, the health department official would ask an individual with COVID-19 about the people with whom he or she recently has had close contact. After that, the health department would then alert the contacts and assess symptoms. On the employer side, it's important for them to cooperate with health departments and realize that the name of the infected individual will not be shared during the process. This isn't about, you know, identifying someone or creating a stigma. It's about keeping people safe and and identifying who might be impacted by the pandemic. Um, Now, I'm going to try not to be as, quote, happy as during a previous turn on Deep Dive, but this one I thought was pertinent. It's from Travis Parsons, who's Associate Director of Occupational Safety and Health at the Laborers Health and Safety Fund of North America, and also a member of NSC's Board of Directors. Travis was speaking during a CPWR webinar exploring contact tracing in the construction industry when he said that contact tracing, quote, is not a panacea. It's not a perfect system, but it does help curb the spread of the virus, and we need to do it. Well, Kevin, now that you've given us some basics behind contact tracing, can you tell us a little bit about what some employer best practices are that people should know about? Sure, sure. Uh, To start, really, CDC advises employers who haven't already done so to designate a COVID-19 coordinator or team within the organization. 
and this entity would be responsible then for overseeing pandemic-related activities and developing a preparedness response and control plan. And certainly contact tracing envelops all of those three things. Um, other important actions that employers can take on the front end are simply just to visit and familiarize themselves with the corresponding health department website to know where to go and where to find things. Then also to do the same with CDC guidance on contact tracing and pandemic control measures. And I know we've mentioned that in previous episodes and certainly a lot of our coverage on the website will, will guide you to the CDC guidance on cdc.gov. Um, in June, our employer, the National Safety Council, published an issue paper and policy position on contact tracing as part of its Safer Safe Actions for Employer Returns Initiative. And that's a resource that we hope you kind listeners have consulted over recent months, certainly a lot of good things out there. But within that, uh, those items on, on contact tracing, NSC urges employers to participate in contact tracing in conjunction with public health officials. And uh, some advice that you'll, you'll find there includes, uh, one, just encouraging em- employees to participate in either a technology or, or other system designed to determine employee contacts during the infection period. Um, also, just to seek employee buy-in for contact tracing, whether it's conducted through a mobile app or other means. And another point raised, uh, allow employees who are exposed to the infected individual, and remember that individual was not identified by name, to remove themselves from the workplace and to self-quarantine according to CDC recommendations. Uh, an additional note, it's not so much a best practice as it is just an important theme, something for, for folks to think about. Jane Terry, uh, who's NSC's Vice President of Government Affairs, she helped develop the policy position on contact tracing. And she said that for safety pros to know that although contact tracing is just a vital disease control measure for employers of any size, it can be especially key for smaller organizations where you might find a more immediate trickle-down effect on the general public. Jane gave the example, just consider a rural area in which there's one or perhaps two prominent employers and just the idea to be able to ensure that those employers have resources to keep workers safe will impact how the community keeps itself healthy and safe. Again, just that trickle-down effect and the connection. Now, Kevin, you uh, you just mentioned the use of technology such as uh, mobile apps and contact tracing. How do uh, some of those methods work? No, technology definitely is a big part of safety professionals' lives, as, as we've written in past issues, and, and contact tracing really is no different. And to that effect, I'm reminded of the layout for the story in the November issue. If you haven't seen seen it already, it's the handy work of our senior graphic designer, Mike Sharkey. But it displays a grid of masked workers who are connected by dots, and then there's a location icon appearing above each worker. I thought that just was really a good illustration of this. But below the layout, as, as the story begins, you'll see an anecdote about a construction project in which supervisors there implemented a wearable technology as a form of contact tracing. The workers wore R-bands that were connected to a network of electric nodes that were situated around the job site. So with this setup, using another hypothetical, if a worker had tested positive for COVID-19 or been exposed to someone who had, the device network could then generate a report confirming the recent job path of the affected worker to determine which other individuals potentially were exposed. Just as an important disclaimer, uh, this particular instance, um, the workers were informed and trained on the technology, and then they were required to consent to its use as a, as a condition of employment. So that leads a little bit to what you said at, at the top, Alan, just with, with concerns vis-a-vis privacy. There are studies and anecdotal evidence, and certainly maybe some of you listening out there can attest to this, just you kind of you express those those concerns over being tracked and just the idea the notion that your privacy and even your civil liberties are being violated there is some some discussion of that certainly in the story and you'll find more there about about those things but really what the experts stress and in the documents we cite stress is just the importance of using methods that keep any geolocation data anonymous and encrypted and deleting that data after it no longer is relevant or timely if you or working through a case of contact tracing and you've already gotten to, to the bottom, so to speak, of who's been in contact with whom over over those 48 hours, you don't need to keep that data any longer. You can discard it. Um, there are other kinds of wearables or mobile, excuse me, mobile apps out there that are either in circulation or development. Uh, mentioning that NSC document again, remember reading about some of those there. One, one method I know uses Bluetooth signaling to locate other users in the area 
And then the app would alert users anonymously in the event that they came into contact with an individual with a confirmed case of COVID-19. Um, for the old school contact tracers, I guess, manual contact tracing does exist. Um, one construction project that had, I'd learned about it involved workers who kept a COVID-19 card in their pocket. The front of their card included the worker's name and identification. And then on the back, the workers were required to write the names of any colleagues with whom they came in contact, again, under those CDC parameters we mentioned. This was then a daily process, and there was a, a new card for each day, but the same principles of tracing applied. If you had, had found, again, hypothetically, someone who was a confirmed case, you'd go back, and instead of checking a, a mobile data report, you could then check the card. Well, thanks, Kevin, for sharing the perspectives from all these experts in your story and for giving us some good insight into the value of contact tracing in workplaces, especially in times like today during the COVID-19 pandemic when this is so important. Uh, for any of our listeners out there who want to read more uh, in Kevin's story, you can check us out in the November print issue of Safety and Health magazine, or you can find us online and you can go to safetyandhealthmagazine.com. If you're listening to this podcast, we're pretty sure you like staying safe on the job and keeping others safe as well. We're also pretty sure that you want to stay safe and healthy when you're away from work. And we have a great way to help you out. It's Family Safety and Health Magazine from the makers of the award-winning Safety and Health Magazine. Family Safety and Health has tips and advice on topics from the home to the roadway and from your local parks and recreation areas to your medicine cabinet. Visit nsc.org wellness or call 800-621-7619 to learn how you can get a subscription for yourself, your coworkers, your friends, and your family. Remember, that's Family Safety and Health, brought to you by the team that brings you Safety and Health magazine each and every month. Powered industrial trucks, more commonly known as forklifts, are used frequently in a number of different industries and locations, including warehouses, shipyards, construction sites, and manufacturing facilities. Despite that frequent use, understanding powered industrial truck safety is definitely not a given, as evidenced by the thousands of injuries per year and the thousands of OSHA citations. Joining us today to answer our questions about powered industrial truck slash forklift safety are the National Safety Council's senior safety consultants, Joanne Dankard and David Consider. Right, we'd like to welcome you both to On the Safe Side. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alan. To begin, uh, I guess first question, what do organizations or people typically not understand when it comes to forklift or, or powered industrial truck safety and, and where do they usually go wrong? Alan, I'll take that one. So I think, first of all, thinking that a particular type of forklift, whether it's a stand up or sit down, that it drives or reacts like a motor vehicle. We're all used to driving a car or a truck. Um, and forklifts are very different with regards to the center of gravity, steering wheels, and things like that. Um, you, you know, if you look at this in relationship to OSHA's most frequently cited, we're not doing operator training. So they forget or don't recognize that specialized training is needed um, and that there should be um, an evaluation for the operator. Now, there's a lot of different ways that that can take place, but what we're really trying to do is to make sure that people know what they're doing when they um, get on that lift. I think another thing to consider would be what's the rating of that lift and understanding that they don't overload the lift, um, that you know the, the counterbalance for it is appropriate based on the types of materials that they're going to be lifting on a regular basis, whether they're unloading trucks or um, putting things into a warehouse and so forth. Um, I think the the speed of operation, you know, there's kind of this um, unwritten rule per se that you want to go just as fast as a fast walk would be. Um, and now forklifts, uh, newer models have electronics on it that it makes it really easy for the employer to set it or, or quote unquote, put a governor on it so that you can't go too fast. But there's always that kind of balance between speed of work I need to get done and then speed um, where I just want to, to be fast, you know, and that weight and speed because of the blind spots on a forklift, um, you know, pedestrians can get in spots where the operator doesn't see them. They can become pinned or even crushed by a, a forklift. 
Um, so that interaction with pedestrians is really important to have that um, kind of set up. And then also I would say the um, loads falling. Um, and again, how I'm traveling with that load uh, and if it's blocking my view, am I traveling in reverse? And then sometimes people will will elevate a coworker right to to pick something off of you know put them on a pallet or they'll just uh, maybe straddle the forks, um, and uh, you know that's pretty risky business. What are some of the hazards involving forklifts and powered industrial trucks that people may not realize or think about? Well, I think part of it is the type of powered industrial truck. Each type presents different operating hazards. You know, for example, a sit down counterbalanced uh, rider truck is more likely than a motorized hand truck to be involved in a load falling incident uh, because the sit down rider type truck can lift a load uh, much higher than just pushing a hand truck. Uh, Workplace type and conditions are also factors. Uh, For example, in retail establishment, there's a lot of challenges because um, of pedestrian safety or how they may be even working around um, uh, clients in the store type of a thing. So trucks can be inadvertently driven off of docks. Uh, They can get caught between the dock and an unsecured trailer. Uh, We mentioned before about uh, pedestrians and forklifts and blind spots or uh, people falling while elevated or or materials falling. Um, Mostly we're talking about with any type of powered industrial truck, you know, collisions, tip overs, uh, falling of loads, and then the proper type of truck Uh, if you have any type of fire or explosion hazards. Uh, The interaction of a forklift and the work environment can create a hazard, Uh, like if we have attachments or we make modifications uh, to a forklift uh, for different types of loads. Um, Choosing uh, um, a hand truck versus a forklift, maybe when it's more appropriate or easier. Uh, The type of fuel, if we're talking about uh, diesel, versus a battery, versus LPG, uh, and then ensuring forklifts are regularly inspected and properly maintained. Again, if we go back to OSHA's most frequently cited, that um, examination before being placed into, into service is really critical. And if something's not working, you know, the steering uh, doesn't feel right, the brakes are a little soft, I don't have uh, lights or, um, a fire extinguisher, you know, anything with that lift truck, if it's not quite right, it really needs to be taken out of service. And David, I was curious if you could explain to our audience the stability triangle and why that's so important. Yeah, one of the hardest things for forklift operators to learn during training is how to maintain your center of gravity with in the stability triangle. And one of the most important things you need to do while the forklift is in use is to make sure it remains stable. Unstable forklifts are the cause of many preventable injuries and deaths each year, especially when they fall on our operators. And so any discussion of the basics of forklifts would be incomplete uh, without a discussion of the center of gravity and the stability triangle. To understand how forklifts work, consider the example of a lever, right? So on a lever, the heavier weight or downward force at one end is going to cause the upward force and propel the other end. When you slide that weight away from the pivot point or fulcrum or that center, it's easier to tip the lever. And so just like a lever, forklifts have a pivot point and this is usually found at the front axle. Now the counterweight is the weight built into the forklift's basic structure and it's used to offset that load's weight and to maximize a vehicle's resistance from tipping over. This makes up one side of the lever. The other side of the lever is made up of the forks and the load. And so in other words, this means if you lift a 5,000 pound load, you're going to need more than 5,000 pounds of counterweight or the forklift's going to tip over. Now the center of gravity. This is the point on the unloaded forklift where all the weight is concentrated. And typically this is going to be found right underneath where the driver's sitting. Okay. That load will also have 
a center of gravity. So when you pick up a load, together the load and the forklift together are going to create that combined center of gravity. Uh, to Joanne's uh, discussion earlier about a vehicle, right? So a personal vehicle is built on this uh, four-point suspension, if you will, that really provides the stability from tipping over. Well, forklift is actually built on a three-point suspension, just like a triangle. And so there's two support points at both ends of the front axle and a third support point at the center of the rear axle. And so these three points form that stability triangle. And within it lies that forklift's center of gravity. Again, the point where all the forklift's weight is going to be concentrated. Typically, this point is in the center of the forklift. Again, in a typical uh, counter sit balanced forklift, that center is going to be right underneath the driver's seat. Now, when a forklift is loaded, the center of gravity shifts forward. When a forklift is unloaded, the center of gravity now is going to shift back to the center. And again, if that combined center of gravity moves outside that stability triangle, your forklift may tip over. And so the easiest way that we can describe this is the sides of the stability triangle that runs along the front axle, again, the pivot point, if that load is too heavy, and the center of gravity moves past this line, that forklift likely is going to end up in a front tip over situation. When the combined center of gravity moves to the outside, your forklift will now likely tip to the side or the back. This is going to be called what uh, uh, we know as a side or back tip over. If that combined center of gravity is too close to the edge of the stability triangle that we just described, Driving too fast, driving too slow, uh, carrying the load too high um, is going to quickly move it out of that stability triangle. You can avoid this by always paying attention to the lifting capacity of the forklift and ensuring you never exceed that. You can see the load center on the data plate, which is fixed to the forklift. And you can also see any differing load centers showing you what you can lift and how to lift it. Lastly, always try to visualize that stability triangle each time you move your forklift, whether you're moving a load or not. There are several phases involved in a forklift or powered industrial truck operator's process of transporting a load. Um, what's important for operators to know about checking loads before lifting them, and what are some things they need to keep in mind when stacking or placing items? It all starts off with that infamous worksite inspection, and this should be conducted at least once a day and before each shift. And so some areas that we're going to be inspecting in this worksite inspection is ensuring that there's adequate lighting to operate the forklift in those areas. Um, we could be checking for any potential indoor hazards, uh, such as sprinklers, heaters, pipes and light fixtures that we may uh, come in contact with, uh, and checking outdoor for any potential hazards as well, such as bridging, uh, phone lines, overhead power lines. Knowing the environment where you will be driving and checking for pedestrians, blind corners, and traffic is also key. We should ask ourselves, will a spotter be required or needed when you're driving through an area where your view is blocked? We should also know the surface that we're driving on and how that can change. And when we look at surface conditions, uh, we're including items such as ramps uh, and other slope surfaces that could affect that, that vehicle stability, uh, ruts, potholes, uh, uneven terrain, mud, sand, water, uh, even snow and ice conditions, and really any other conditions in the workplace that could affect the safe operation of your forklift. Before picking up a load, we should know the weight of the load, uh, where the load is going, the route that we're going to take, and the composition of the load to be carried, and that load stability. When stacking or placing items, ensure we have examined the data plate and or load chart on the forklift to make sure you can safely lift the load, and we got the right forklift for the load being lifted. Check that load 
and just as needed for stability, such as rearranging the load on the forks, uh, 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 adjusting the forks, uh, possibly even wrapping or banding the load to, to secure it on those forks. And if the load includes hazardous materials, check the safety data sheet or SDS and follow your company's handling procedures and always put on that safety belt. Uh, and if the load is gonna be placed on a racking system, let's ensure that that racking system has also been inspected and is capable of withstanding the weight of the load. Well, in fiscal year 2019, many of the OSHA citations through the Powered Industrial Truck Standard involved operator training. I know that NSC offers forklift and powered industrial truck safety training for operators. How can workers get that training during this time? And what are some other resources people can utilize? NSC, the National Safety Council, offers education in forklift operation really in three ways. Uh, number one, NSC can come to you. Our instructor comes to your site to conduct the training, uh, complete with skill testing of your operators. Uh, number two, we can train your own operators. Uh, we can have you purchase a package training from the NSC, which includes everything you need to train your operators, a facilitator's guide, participant's guide. Only thing we need is uh, for you to supply the instructors. And third, NSC can train your company's instructors. Probably the most cost-effective method for companies needing to train multiple forklift operators, either in large quantities or on demand. And NSC trains your, uh, uh, your instructors so that they can train your company's forklift operators. Well, Joanne and David, thank you once again for joining us on the safe side. And thank you for all this helpful and valuable information. And thank you so much for all that you do for safety. Well, as I alluded to in our last episode, our holidays might feel and look a little different this year, including Thanksgiving. However, the current pandemic likely won't stop many of us from enjoying our favorite Turkey Day foods. In this edition of our Pop Quiz, we'll look at some of our favorite Thanksgiving fare, as well as some of our least favorite. Well, I'll go first. Turkey is a big part of the meal, but it, to me, it's the, it's the straight man to the meal. And basically, with turkey, it's just you know, don't have it be too dry. Um, it's really Thanksgiving meal is about the accompanying dishes and stuffing. As far as least favorites, uh, it's cranberry relish. And I know that uh, the canned cranberry gets a, a bad rap, but uh, I would take that any day over cranberry relish. Barry, what about you? All good ones from you, Alan. Um, I, I'm going to throw my head and I'm going to move to dessert. So shout out to my Aunt Judy, who for decades has made the strawberry jello pretzel salad, which is a delight. So just imagine pretzels on the bottom of a dish, a cream cheese type mixture over the top, and strawberry jello with fresh strawberries cut up into it. And you throw that into the fridge and it's just at the end of the meal, it's phenomenal. My apologies to all the vegetable fans out there, but... I just can't get behind green bean casserole in any of its forms. Uh, when I was growing up, I remember the only thing I really enjoyed about green bean casserole was I would pick the, the French fried onions off the top. Uh, so that, that was something I, but I did pass on the, uh, the green beans themselves. So thank you, humble green bean, but not on my Thanksgiving plate. So Kevin, how about you? Well, I myself can get behind the green bean casserole. That's uh I, I did some some soul searching, and I I agree with Alan's assessment. We all could have said turkey, but that is that is a straight man. But as far as the side dishes, uh, I would go with green bean casserole, and a with with stuffing being a close second. It's just it's it's that combination. I wouldn't ordinarily have cream of mushroom soup for anything else other than slathering it with green beans and, and French fried onions. So it's always a nice delicacy that time of year. The other one I, I struggled with, and I'm going to go with something that might sound counterintuitive. I'm going to say mashed potatoes, and it's not that I dislike them in any way, shape, or form, but it seems like that of all the Thanksgiving sides is the one thing that you're kind of getting in ordinary time, so to speak. So for me, when I see the mashed potatoes, it's my eyes almost just are, are, are averted to something else. I'm like, ah, ho-hum mashed potatoes. Yeah, it totally makes sense. <laughs> Now we want to hear from our listeners. Chime in with your favorite or least favorite Thanksgiving foods by emailing us at safehealth at nsc.org. 
or check in with the hashtag SafeSidePopQuiz on social media. We'll compile some of our favorite responses and read them during a future episode. Well, we want to say thanks to everyone out there for spending some time with us today. And remember, if you want to keep your employees, your colleagues, and your family members safe, we have just a publication for you, Family Safety and Health. Each issue is packed with helpful tips that will keep families safe at home and in the community, along with informational articles about your health. To get a free copy or learn more, visit nsc.org wellness or subscribe by calling 800-621-7619. In the meantime, feel free to tell a fellow safety pro about this podcast. If you'd like to share some feedback, email us at safehealth at nsc.org. To find stories such as the contact tracing article or Alan's November story covering confined spaces, as well as all the latest news about safety and health, visit us online at safetyandhealthmagazine.com. Also, make sure you follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or LinkedIn. We'd like to thank our colleague and sound guru, Chelsea Yang. Original music for this podcast was provided by Steve Maslin. On behalf of our team at Safety and Health Magazine, we hope you and your friends and family are all safe and healthy amid the COVID-19 pandemic. We'll be back next month with another episode to have more safety-related discussions, talk to trusted voices from around the profession, and hopefully make you smile a little. Until then, please stay on the safe side.